Hello, good afternoon and welcome to Mayday Live here on TV3. My name is Park Wissiasari. Coming up in the next 60 minutes. Coming up, an Accra High Court grants NDC Chairman Samuel Afusu Ampofu and Deputy Communications Officer Kweku Boahin 100,000 bail after being charged for conspiracy to cause harm and assault on a public officer. Also, customers of GN Savings and Loans demand release of the locked up fan. The age of forces racing against time to help hundreds of thousands affected by Cyclone Idai. We've got details of all these stories plus many more coming up in the next 60 minutes. Of course, we're streaming live on Facebook. You can also join us with your views, comments, and suggestions on any of our top stories this hour. Visit any of our social media pages on Facebook and on Twitter. Now, two leading members of the Opposition National Democratic Congress, National Chairman Samuel Ofosu Ampof and Deputy Communications Officer Kweku Boahin, have been granted bail by an Accra High Court. They have been charged for conspiracy to cause harm and assault on a public officer. The two pleaded not guilty to the charges and have been admitted to 100 hundred thousand cities plus one surety bail each now let's first listen to member of the national democratic congress legal team victor adaudu the tip that we listen to i don't think that um, that alone can secure conviction i don't think so that is why chairman has always said that it is a doctor tip and he cannot speak to that tip until we know the day the time the venue when this was done and who recorded it, then that is when we can move, we can clear that header. Now, let's also listen to the Deputy Attorney General, Joseph Benka, uh, who's been leading the prosecution to press charges against Ofosu Ampofo and Kwekubwahin. If the national chairman of the ruling party commits an offense, he ought to be tried. Simplicity. No one is above the law. And the Constitution itself is very clear on this matter. And so any person who falls foul of the law is made to face the law. If at the end of the day the court finds you guilty or acquits you, that's the decision of the court. For us, we are not judging any matter. And we will never judge any matter before the judge passes judgment because we are not competent to pass judgment on anything. It is the judge. And we are going to ensure that anything that is done is in compliance with the laws of the land. Evidence of the case that we are going to actually adumbrate or adduce will prove whether or not he was in the meeting. And whatever alibi they want to file, we are not contesting anything. But when it comes, we shall mount a defense to that effect. All right, so we're going to stay a while longer on this subject. Uh, this is our main story for the day. Remember, we're streaming live on Facebook. My colleague, uh, Selam Amenya, uh, he's been monitoring the court proceedings this morning and joins us with further updates on this developing story. Uh, Selam, thank you very much for your time. First of all, what was the main argument put forward by the defense team? Well, the defense is saying, among other things, that um, the prosecution need to prove where this recording was actually done, the time, and specifically the venue. Their point is that, one, if it was recorded without the consent of the one who altered it or the one who was speaking, uh, it amounts to a breach of the law constitutionally. It is not right. And apart from that, if it was recorded in a private residence or where it was recorded, does it amount to a public place or a private place? If it is a private place, then it means that you invaded the privacy of that particular person. So can you now turn that in something that is unlawful? as evidence in court. Even though it was in the interest of the public? Yes, that, that's what it is. So mm. it, it's, it's going to be an interesting argument in court, mm. and I believe that this would kind of bring some finality to all these leaked tapes that we've been having. Mm. And what was the mood like in court today? Yes, in court it was very tense. The place was packed. As at 9 a.m., the court was full. You couldn't go in any longer. Uh, there were other cases that were supposed to be heard, and all those people were standing outside. We had NDC bigwigs like uh, uh, the my, minority leader in parliament, Harry Nidrusu, standing outside, Hannah Bisu, and a lot more 
of the people who could not go inside. When you come down to the law con uh, court complex, that's the new law court complex, there were a lot of supporters there, and uh, the, the police were deployed from the uh, formed police in the FPU, mm. and we also some, saw others with a CID jacket, asked whether they belonged to the, SWAT, the famous SWAT team mm. or not. We couldn't tell, but security was very tight. Mm. And after proceedings, they kept the two accused persons up there for over 40 minutes. And the supporters were saying that they were not going to leave until they see that the two gentlemen are released and they've left the court premises. Mm. So they were We also understand some, uh, that the former president, uh, John Mahama, was there in court today. Yes, he was, he was there as early as 8.30. He was seated in the court premises together with uh, uh, the, uh, his spokesperson, that is Madame uh, Joyce Bar, Joyce Bar Mukhtar. Mukhtar. We also uh, saw other big ways of the party. Uh, Johnson Asedin Ketia was there. And uh, all other, other executives were there to throw their support behind uh, the, the two accused persons. And do we know if these two people have all met the bail conditions? Yes. Once, once they've been let out of the courtroom, I'm sure that uh, if they've not met, probably uh, they are almost done with uh, meeting the conditions. And do we um, also know when they're likely to return to yes, court? Yes, we, we are going back on the 7th of May mm. for hearing to continue. Mm. Uh, the, the Attorney General was there, right? The Attorney General was there, mm. but uh, she was not the one leading the prosecution. It was the Deputy AG, that is Joseph Benkwa, who was leading the prosecution. Oh, I think this morning, uh, from the court, as you can see, uh, the former uh, attorney, attorney general, in short, uh, the deputy general, Joseph Benka, uh, the chairman of the National Democratic Congress, uh, Fusu Ampofu, uh, there uh, being uh, hailed by the supporters of the National Democratic Congress. Uh, we're told security was extremely tight this morning. Uh, former President uh, John Mahama was also there. Uh, you can see him in your shorts now. Uh, pretty much uh, interesting development in court today. Thank you very much, Salam, for, for joining us and for bringing us updates on this story. Now, the minority in Parliament is calling on government to urgently allow for uh, usage of the 200 million uh, 5,000 Sagaleme housing project. Over 600 units have been completed but left unoccupied. Upon assumption of office by the new Patriotic Party administration, the government caused an investigation in the cost of the project. Here's a report which is yet to be made public. A uh, ranking member of the Works and House and committee, Manuel Bedra, uh, was been inter has been interacting with the press uh, on a tour of the facility and says the non-occupancy is untenable. Let's now go live to our parliamentary correspondent, Komala Kluche, uh, who has all the very latest update, Komala. 36 housing units completed so far should be done without further delay. Government should show proof of commitment as to the delivery of the 200,000 housing units earmarked for the regional capitals as contained in the 2019 budget estimate in order to reduce the national housing de deficit. We thank you for coming and thank you for your attention. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so the minority uh, has been raising issues about the construction of uh, the uh, housing unit here in Saglemid. One must, however, say that the building after uh, or uh, the construction after uh, the 2012 agreement or um, uh, 2012 approval by the Parliament of Ghana, uh, no one has occupied that. At least we've gone round the facility to find out that because it has not been occupied for some time, uh, the building parts of the building have started showing signs of cracks and all that. At least if you build and you do not occupy, that in itself would affect the structure of the building. We have seen a, quite a number of them. But we'll put a question to the ranking member of the Works and Housing Committee of Parliament, Emmanuel. Bedra, you have gone round, you have seen the building. It is, uh, to a very large extent, completed uh, uh, some 600 units of the sort. For you, the majority or the government said they were going to investigate uh, the whole deal. What is the state of that investigation now? We are still waiting on the Minister of, uh, for Works and Housing to tell us that uh, they have gone far with the investigation. In fact, the last time we had a meeting with him, he said he was going to produce a document to prove that they've gone far. Our point is that even though you want to investigate, people should be allowed to occupy their space. The place has been completed. 
pressmen have been here, you have been here, you've seen it. At least if these houses have been given to the pressmen, it will, it will reduce your, your, your housing deficit at least. And you will also have a place to stay. So we don't want of this place to be because of works and house as well as the government to go into a negotiation with a contractor measures OAS constructors constructors Ghana Limited to enable them to come back to site what sort of negotiation are you looking at so far we've been told uh, from the contractors uh, correspondent to the ministry there were issues about tax uh, waivers and tax, uh, tax issues, which has not been dealt with. The Condada has left the site because of those tax waivers and tax issues. We want the ministry to come back and have discussion with the contractor so that they can allow the contractors to come back to site and continue the work. Uh, so far, so much has been paid. Over 188, 81 million has been paid to the contractor. If there are issues that borders on payment, those issues are administrative issue which could be dealt with. The contractor must be on site for them to complete whatever they have. You will go and see a lot of materials that are getting you know, out of hand. They, they are there waiting for the government to, and to, to go into negotiation and agree on a task with us for them to continue the project. We have been to some of the rooms, especially like one of these ones I've gone there. I've seen that because it's not been occupied for some time, uh, cracks have started developing. What is the cost to the nation with this uh, 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 buildings abandoned here? Let me also add that this is not the only housing unit that has been abandoned. We've mentioned that we have some at Kong, we have some at in Kofodua, Wa, and Kumasi. They've all been abandoned. The cost of re, you know, construction, the cost of renovation, cost of putting it back uh, will be enormous to the nation. And therefore, we are appealing. It's going to be expensive after you've completed a house and you've not occupied it, and you want to occupy it at a later stage. You have to do some remedial ways. And this remedial way is going to cost us. We cannot quantify it as we, we, we stand now. But I believe that government is going to, you know, uh, uh, also spend money in, in renovating or doing some remedial work. But let me also quick to add that in construction, there is what we call liquidated uh, liability damages or LED or, or what we call retention. Government is supposed to retain part of the money until you hand over the project to government, you are not supposed to do, government is not supposed to spend money. So we expect that you will invoke those clauses, that the contractor will do those remedial works at their own expense before the occupation of the property. All right, many thanks to the ranking member on the minorities, uh, on, on the Works and Housing Committee of Parliament. But Parkwisi, I must say that these are the sides of the building you can see that, uh, well, I mean, it looks it looks uh, very nice from the outside and also inside, I mean, fitted. I mean, if you go in there, you see the tiling and then the other things. One must say, however, that these buildings are ready for use. I can also tell you that after the approval uh, by the Parliament of the Republic of Ghana in 2012, the sum of $200 million for the construction of the project that has gone into it, not much has been done in terms of occupying the building. Komla Kluche, TV3 uh, Komla News. Kluche. Uh, we appreciate that. Awesome. Komla Kluche live from Sagleme. Now, away from that story, some aggrieved customers of GN Savings and Loans uh, Company, as well as Gold Coast Fund Management, have been besieged, uh, have besieged the premises of Coconut Group Hotel, uh, which is one of the subsidiaries of Group Indum, the parent company of the two troubled financial firms. The customers are demanding their locked up funds, some of which have matured, uh, you know, some three months now. Gold Coast Fund Management states and the commission um, is. Uh, currently hearing uh, these complaints in accordance with the provisions of the uh, Securities Industry Act 2016. As you may be aware, the Securities and Exchange Commission has asked uh, Gold Coast Fund Management to, to stop uh, receiving uh, deposits. We've just been joined in the studio by the uh, general manager in charge of investor relations at Gold Coast Securities Kofi thank you very much for your time. I know your office has been inundated with the calls and uh, many people coming in to demand their monies. How are you handling this pressure? Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you and to your viewers as well. Um, well, as you know, the pressure hasn't been easy. 
um, but we've taken steps to talk to our customers. Um, the numbers are quite huge, and so it's been difficult reaching everybody. But as much as possible, we've made efforts to talk to everybody. As I talked to you, the, a team of managers uh, put together who are calling our top uh, clients as I talk to you. It's something we are doing between today and tomorrow. So whilst we do that, then the branches deal with those who are working into the branches as well. It's, it's been difficult, but you don't try our best to manage it. In terms of... To pay them? Liquidity is a difficulty we have that we're Where working on. Where is their money? They are in investments. And you know, sometimes these things happen. It's not every day uh, you see a company in this. But I keep saying, investments have matured, haven't they? Of course. Uh, but you know, that's why I was going back to say that when a company has done this successfully for all these years, maybe once in a while some of these difficulties come so that we can rethink and redo things. Uh, so I need to understand way. this point clearly. Yes. People have saved their monies with you. Invested. They've been invested yes. over a period of time. Yes. These investments have matured. Yes. Why is it difficult to pay them? Well, when somebody brings money to you as an investment house mm. and they agree that you should invest it, they're expecting that you put the money to work. Right. And then you can take it and pay it back. Right. But every now and then you have situations where, for example, getting the money back doesn't work out in terms of the timing. As you want it. So, for example, you're saying the investments are there, but turning those investments to liquid cash so that we can pay is the difficulty. So it's not that. Why is it the difficulty? Well, it happens. It happens. You would make your projections. Have you been affected by the current happenings within the financial market? Of course. You have to remember that all, there are a lot of interlinkages within the system. Mm. So you may give money to me. I give the money to another bank or another investment house or another. Uh, finance company to work with so that we can return the money plus the principal. So as long as there are difficulties along the chain, mm. it would affect you. Mm. There are other investments we've made, for example, in pre-finance, some projects uh, of the country, and we haven't had the monies coming back as fast as we wanted. Of course, efforts are being made, and so the monies are coming. But we are, we are sure that as long as the investment have been properly done, we'll get the money back. Have deposits gone down? Are people... We have not taken any deposits since October for that Since point. October yes. of last year? Yes. You haven't taken any more? We have not taken any deposit because, one, that product is no longer available. So we can't take anybody's money into that product again. So we have not taken anybody's money So why is the Secret Selection Commission asking you not to take any further deposits? Unfortunately, I can't speak to that, but... We had actually also communicated that we have done that. We have not taken anybody's money uh, since October. Possibly it is just to reiterate what we have already done to the public. But the truth is that it is something we've done since October. We haven't taken anybody's money because that product is no longer available. So how are we going to resolve this challenge? Well, I'm happy to note that from the statement of the SEC, uh, SEC yesterday, they confirmed that we've taken a number of solutions to them. The, we have said that the assets are there. It is turning this asset into liquid cash within a short time that you know, poses the problem. But given a bit of time and given their approval of our solutions, we believe that we can turn the situation around. And so I am quite positive that once we get a go ahead with the options and the solutions we provided to the exchange and they give us their go ahead, We'll be able to roll this out and gradually build back the liquidity. You are aware uh, customers are becoming increasingly impatient. You are aware this has become a matter of security. Even so yes, it has been difficult. Mm. And uh, I'll be honest with you, it hasn't been easy managing the situation. But you can also understand, especially because there's money that is involved. But I also tell our customers that difficult as it is, violence doesn't help us in any way. Because as a staff, even if I don't run away, any other staff may likely not want to come to the office. It makes it difficult then to meet anybody to interact with. So difficult as the situation is, my plea to our customers is, please don't do anything, that will, any violent activity doesn't help us. Anything that puts the steps we are taking to correct this back doesn't help our situation. So in as much as I empathize the situation, because I have seen some of the situations and they are not pretty, but the truth is that if the money was also there, we would not allow this to happen. We are pleading with them. We are working every day, every night, to ensure that the solutions we are putting together will, will bring some relief to them. We are also raising some money. Mm -hmm. And we are positive that once we have the approval, once we have the go-ahead from 
the others that we are raising the money from, we should be able to take care of the difficulties that our customers are in. Look, mm -hmm. we've worked with them all these 25 years. We've created value for the, our customers all these 25 years. And they'll be part of the success story of the company. And so my plea is that they don't do anything that damages our effort to resolve this situation because we are willing and we are happy to sit with them. We are happy to work to make sure we bring a resolution to this. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Benjamin Kofia Fur. Benjamin Kofia Fur is the general manager in charge of investor relations at Gold Coast Securities. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for bringing us updates on this story. Now, away from that, let's do education. And the former vice chancellor of the University of Education, Winneba, is calling for his immediate reinstatement and that of his dismissed colleagues by the Council of the University. Mauto Avokes said the current vice chancellor, Professor Afol Bruni, and in events leading to his dismissal. Now, breaking his silence almost a year after his dismissal, Professor Avoke said he's been exonerated of the baseless accusations leveled against him. Little did we know that we were still going to be at home till date. When all the allegations made against us have been proven to be incorrect, especially by Yoko, a state organization that investigated the said allegation which similarly formed the basis of the university's own fact-finding investigations. The Yoko report, interestingly, indicated that the Transport Committee, which is chaired by the Pro Vice Chancellor, has questions to answer. At the time, Professor Fulbrady was Pro Vice Chancellor. Ladies and gentlemen, it has now become very clear that at least two persons, Reverend Professor Antonia Fulbrady and Professor Ibanoel, Nicholas Abeka, the chairman of the governing council, played very critical roles to ensure the wrongful removal of my colleagues and I from our various offices and position in the university. All right, so you just had uh, the former vice chancellor of the University of Winneba Education, Professor Mauto Avoke, addressing the press my colleague Martin Asiru Date has sat through that press conference. Martin, uh, what were some of the key highlights of the press conference? Well, good afternoon, Pakwesi, and to our viewers as well. It was more or less of the, the breaking of the silence of Mr. Avoke. You know, in the back and forth of the university in the last few months, he has been quiet, but he's a key uh, figure in the, the entire Ampas. And so today he decided to meet the media and give his side of the story. He started by giving a background as to how this whole thing started and said that it was he that even uh, after he had been nominated and appointed as the got um, Professor Afu Bruni to be his vice chancellor and handed over to him. At a point, the chairman of the council, the governing council, that is Professor Abaka, was also working very closely with him. So to him, both of them later, because especially Professor Alfred Bruni, wanted the position of vice chancellor and didn't get it, masterminded his dismissal. And he gave a chronology of events leading to how they played a role. One was that a fact-finding committee was put together to look into how the university can defend itself in a case that was brought against the university by uh, one fisherman in the area who was represented by the member of parliament for Ifutu. Mm, um, Afenyo Marking. Yes, Mr. Afenyo Marking. Now, this committee ended up getting information, and he is alleging, the, that's Professor Mautko, uh, Mauto Avoke, Mauto Avoke, is alleging that the information that the fact-finding committee f got was leaked to this fisherman and helped um, uh, him to uh, win the case against the university. Win the case against the university. Mm. And it was all part of the ploy to get, get him out of position. And he has gone on to say, I'm going to just read portions of what he said. He says, Professor Afroboni did contest with me uh, for the position of the vice chancellor of the university and was unsuccessful as I was the one who was recommended by the search committee and thus eventually got appointed by the council. And fast forward to this point, he said, it is now clear who in the cloak or dead of the night was meeting the member of parliament for a Futu constituency and sharing fabricated materials and official document of the university and misrepresenting same of him as recently claimed by the member of parliament himself on mm. various media platforms. So, that's, uh, so, essentially, we based so on this, conference, really. this press is 
to mm. tell his side of the story mm. and then also to call for his reinstatement and that after all his, that has happened yes, he wants and, to be and reinstated that of his colleagues mm. because uh, it was about four people mm. and him that mm. were dismissed and said that other people who had been dismissed recently are people who knew the history of the university and the history of these uh, developments. And so they, they've been victimized. And, yes, and they are being victimized. By the so uh, his call for his reinstatement, his call, has he said what he will do next if he's not reinstated? Yes, he said that they are waiting on the stakeholders. And we asked him who these stakeholders are. He said the Ministry of Education, the government, the governing council, the current vice chancellor, they all know what has happened and have a role to play. So he's hoping that the stakeholders would go according to the laid down procedures of the university and the states of Ghana and reinstate them. Otherwise, May 26th, they'll be going back to the court. Back to court. Thank you very much, uh, Martin Siedu Data, with updates of that press conference organized by the former uh, Vice Chancellor of the University of Education, Winneba Professor uh, Mauto Avoke. You're still watching Media Life here on TV3. We're streaming live on Facebook. <laughs> All right, and welcome to the business news segment here on Media Live on TV3. Now, management of the Social Security and National Insurance Trust says the trust was not affected by the banking cleanup that led to the closure of some banks. SNIT, which is almost 32% of its investment portfolio in the financial sector, said its investment and savings are secured. The past couple of years, Social Security and National Insurance Trust Net has been in the news for not the very good reasons. The height of public discomfort was when news emerged that some $72 million was spent to procure an IT system that management says it is still struggling to use. Other concerns have also been raised about how the invest monies collected from contributors. But current management of the trust led by Dr. John of Oritinkrain says the new team has done well in prudently managing funds in his care. The debunked fears the trust may have lost monies due to the banking cleanup that saw some seven banks collapse and others forced to merge. Deputy Director of Finance and Administration Mike Ladu said they had secured all their savings. So that's how we went to. So the collapse of the banks did not affect us. Those who went down, we had security. To the extent that we were even told, hold on, or don't exercise your security, give us three weeks, let's sort this out. So three weeks, sorted it out, gave us all our monies. We don't have any problem with that. The scheme currently has about 32% of its investment portfolio in the financial sector, second in hierarchy of investments by state. These, however, have not shielded the scheme from challenges. In 2016, its benefits payment outstripped revenue, and though it recovered making surplus in 2017. The trust relapsed again in 2018. Some 300 million cities more was needed to equal expenditure. This was in the presence of 11% decline from 2017 and an increase in expenditure by 13%. In other news, a draft management policy of April. The new policy aims at pushing for a sustainable management of all fisheries resources. Sector Minister Elizabeth Na Afolikwe disclosed this at a ceremony to reopen the second Dainsu oyster picking season. Co management is defined as the joint sustainable management by government in cooperation with resource users through a formal approach that is tailored to each location. The co management policy will formalize this type of approach to ensure productivity of fisheries resources meets current needs while preserving the ability to meet the needs of future generations. The draft policy lays out the approach but leaves open the flexibility for local communities to make management decisions that are appropriate to their local conditions, culture and practices. In this regard, the government's commitment to develop the fishery sector with an emphasis on revamping the marine and aquaculture sectors has evolved in the formulation and implementation of policies aimed at increasing production from the marine sector. Sector Minister Elizabeth Na Afolekwe commended the Day Association that taking self-help initiatives in the industry. But 
and surrounding communities have really done well. You have shown great fortitude to support the effective and sustainable management of the oyster natural resource in the Densu Delta. Acting Director at the Economic Growth Office of USAID, James Lycos, lauded the effort of the Densu oyster pickers to sustainable fishing. Today, we will see that the Development Action Association, working in partnership with local communities, can demonstrate that Ghana's fisheries resources can be well managed when citizens directly make decisions over their own community resources. The Densu Estuary is in a in Ghana to demonstrate the ability of coastal fisheries collaborative management. This has been a very long way. People didn't act, but core management, we are here. We learned, we understood. We are now looking at a situation whereby next year, around this time, we can also meet and celebrate oyster picking program. Ghana's fishing industry is faced with several challenges putting the industry at near collapse. To help address this, USAID partnered with the Ministry of Fisheries and Aquaculture Development to develop the national co-management policy. The five-month oyster picking closed season was the second successive attempt by the Dentsu Oyster Pickers Association. In other news, the UK government has indicated it will soon take over the offices of men's gold in England in accordance with Companies Act 2006, Section 1000. This is because the office has not been active over the last few months. A statement issued from the company's house in UK noted that men's gold operations in UK will be dissolved and properties belonging to the company would subsequently return to the British Crown. That's all for the very latest in business news. For more news, you can log on to our website, 3news.com. We'll take a short break. When now, acclaimed comedian DKB has blamed the slow-paced growth of the comedy in Ghana to ill-intentioned vilification and bad-mouthing. DKB believes comedy will take its rightful place if Ghanaians encourage performers rather than dampening their spirits. Compete favorably. What do we need? What we need is Ghanaians placing value on us when they need be. Stop. Born Derek Kwabena, born has been another fourth of the campaign to take GH comedy to the next level. But the journey, according to him, has not been smooth. He blamed the inability of Ghanaian comedians to achieve international success to deliberate vilification by detractors. People go there and they sell us short. Our comedy industry is dead. Our comedy industry is useless. There is no hope. Why? You are not encouraging the foreigner to invest in us. Us are now. I don't know of any Ghana comedian who has been invited to Nigeria because our own people sell us short. Our own people don't put premium on us when they go out there. And it's, it's a very big head because, look, if you come to a country and I tell you Kofi is the funniest guy, even if Kofi says hello to you, you will laugh. Do you know why? Because I've prepared your mind. But imagine you come and I tell you, Kojo, Terrible, a cabinet to horrible comedians. Nothing they will do would make you happy. The award winning comedian regrets the widespread perception that Ghanaian comedians are not funny has made it difficult to even attract sponsorship for comedy shows. We don't we are not forcing people to love us, but if you don't love us, don't spoil our name. And with that, if you're a foreigner and you see good re reviews about us online, of course. You'd be interested in having us visit your country. DKB believes Ghanaian comedians can rub shoulders with some of the continent's finest when given the needed push by Ghanaians. Deal with it! Deal with it! Deal with it in their mind! 
Now, step one pub in Dunsoman was the location for Onyai FM's Omuchio party over the weekend. The event, which comes off every two weeks, serves as a platform to entertain listeners and to serve them Omuchio, uh, which has gradually become a Sunday afternoon meal across the country. Now, it was another exciting time with host Emmanuel Osayajima and his pandits as the engaged audience in a proverbial competition as the dining went on. Now, First Class Live Band was also there to treat patrons to some uh, classic high life songs. Make a date with Onya FM's Mutual Party Train at a venue near you. This class. Now, before we go, Saxa's music has parted ways with the assignee and rapper strongman Benna. A statement released by Saxa's music said both parties parted, uh, both parties agreed to go their separate ways. Now, Saxa's music went ahead to describe strongman as a gem and wished him well in his future endeavors. Our checks, however, reveal that in the original contract, Saxa's music uh, was to manage strongman for a period of 10 years. Now, in a tweet, strongman wrote, most good footballers turn out to be bad coaches. Uh, don't be deceived. At some, uh, to some fans, uh, some fans see Strongman's pose as a shade, uh, suggesting Sarkozy is a great rapper, but a bad manager. <laughs> Sometimes. The best in the game are actually not the best at coaching the game. There is no doubt that Sarkozy is a fine rapper. But you see, it is not easy molding a talent. And himself, people like Hammer contributed to Sarkozy's success. The question is, does he have the same coaching skills as these people? Because raising a talent and being a talent are two different things. Who knows? If these are not working out, the best thing is to break. So even if it's for 10 years and you realize that in two years, things will work out, I think it's better to break than to wait for the fall of 10 years. I didn't like the idea of um, Strongman signing to Sarkozy in the first place. I thought maybe another label would have been better for him. And Sarkozy and Strongman's vibe doesn't really click. If you listen to their music, you see the vibe is not really there. So the contract terminating, I'm not surprised. Right, so on that success note, we conclude Midday Life here on TV3. Thanks very much for watching. For more news, you can log on to our website, 3news.com. My name is Parkus Yasari. Thanks to the production team and thanks to the cameraman.